What's going on everybody? My name is Johnny Bannon and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trepid Technologies. In today's video, we're going to be going over Domain 1.2, summarizing security concepts for the Security Plus SY0-701 exam. In this video, we're going to be covering AAA, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting. And we're going to define each one of those A's, go over some protocols and technologies that align with those A's, and how it relates to our cybersecurity fundamentals. So that being said, Let's get my face out of here and let's start learning. All right, so the first thing we're gonna go over is authentication. So authentication, the definition is the process of verifying the identity of a user, device, or system before granting access to resources or servers. So what we're saying here is essentially imagine we have a subject. So let's say this is our subject here. And this subject needs access to what's behind this door. I'm not the best drawer, okay? If you want some cybersecurity training with good drawing, go look at IBM's uh, cybersecurity playlist. No more free plugs. So let's say you need what's behind this door. Behind this door is an object or a resource. So let's just say this is our app server. And this is our object. And let's say this door here is what's the, or let's say there's actually a bouncer here. This, when you go to access what's behind this door, this bouncer has to open it for you. So this may be something like an LDAP server that's going to verify your identity and actually allow you to then see if you can access this app server because the next step would be authorization, right? Here, this bouncer is just checking to make sure that you're on his list and that you can verify your identity. That is authentication. So when a subject, and that subject doesn't always have to be a user, right? It can be a device or system wants access to a resource or an object on your enterprise, whether that be a remote user or someone sitting on prem, you need to first verify who you are. And we do that verification by you providing an identity. That identity can be a username and password. It can be a token or it could be a combination of the two. And this is where we get into our different authentication factors within authentication. So our three authentication factors, how do we provide identity verification? Well, we can provide something like a username, something you know. So this could be a password, a PIN, or a passphrase. This is gonna be the most common one. So when you're logging into your Gmail, you have to put in an email and then a password. That would be your username and then your password, and that is something you know. Something that you came up with. That's why it's something you know. And then if we want additional authentication factors, which we should always do, and as we kind of build up to our zero trust architecture, this is something that's huge when we implement uh, zero trust and always trusting but verifying, right? Adding in that second factor of authentication. So something you have. This can be a physical token or devices that a user possessed like a smart card. So I came from the government where we had something called CACs, which are common access cards. And we'd have to plug that CAC into a CAC reader and then provide a pin. So that was our two factor. This could be security tokens. So old school, if you ever have those RSA tokens, something that's uh, common now, something called a YubiKey, that could be like a security token. That's physical, right? Something that's gonna be on your person that you have to keep accountability of. Or we could have mobile authentication apps. So something I use all the time would be an authenticator, the Google Authenticator app on my phone. That's something you have because that phone should be in my possession and I should always be protecting that phone. The third factor that we can integrate is something you are. This is gonna be biometrics. So these are gonna be your biological characteristics that are unique to you that can identify you. So we do this all the time with Apple, the face ID, thumbprint. A lot of times when you're going into top secret or uh, uh, cleared environments, this is going to be something that you provide as well. Maybe a badge or something you have, and then a fingerprint or something you are to give that two factor. So those are going to be the different factors of authentication. Now down here, I want to go over kind of a little bit things more technical. So on a typical enterprise using like ADUC or Active Directory, what's the authentication process? So well, one, something I don't show here is that this computer as a, uh, a subject trying to access an LDAP server, the object, right? 
it also authenticates. But I'm just going to go over the user here. So in a domain, in an enterprise, in an Active Directory enterprise, this actual physical hardware has to be an object in your Active Directory forest. Um, it has to be part of that domain. So I'm not trying to skip steps here. I don't want comments saying, well, what about the actual system? Of course, I just want to go over the authentication request from the user perspective, okay? So let's say you need to log into your enterprise. You provide a username and a password, and we can use a protocol called LDAP. So LDAP stands for the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. So LDAP is an actual protocol that we can use that can give us a hierarchical uh, architecture to authenticate and authorize users. So when I type in my username and password and it gets sent off to our LDAP servers here, so this is my domain controller 01, domain controller 02, and this is an on-prem Active Directory of deployment, not Azure, that LDAP request is gonna be sent. The LDAP servers are gonna now see does the provider identification match the credentials in our system. So it's just going to look at that object that's trying to be accessed, that user object, and say, okay, is this his actual password? No, deny access. Yes, grant access. And once we grant access and we verify that identity, now we're going to move into something called authorization. Now once you've been identified, what can you access? What is behind that door that you're going to get access to? What side of the club are you going to, right? So authorization. So definition, authorization is the process of determining what actions or resources an authenticated user, device, or system is permitted to access. So once we've been authenticated, now we're going to see what we have access to. So kind of building off what we learned about the CIA triad, this is our confidentiality, right? Building those access control schemes and methods. So with authorization, some key things and principles you have to think about. What kind of access controls do we have? Are we using discretionary, mandatory, or role-based access controls? Role-based, I feel like the most obvious one here, this is if you're a database administrator, you're going to obviously need elevated permissions to the databases. That doesn't mean you're going to get access to the network infrastructure, the routers and switches. If you're a database administrator, you're not going to get elevated privileges to your cybersecurity solutions like the McAfee or McAfee server, the HBSS server, or the Splunk server, right? That's role-based access control. And this is all, all these are going to follow based uh, the least privilege uh, principle, okay? Mandatory access control is based on a need to know. So let's say you have an R&D department. And that R&D department is developing IP, developing copyrights for your business. If you sit in the accounting department or the human resources department, do you have a need to know about the sensitive information that's being developed? No, you don't. That's mandatory access control. Discretionary access control, this is actually the default Windows access control method where whoever the owner is of that data, so let's say I create a new folder on my desktop, I set the permissions, okay? So we have to think about our access control modes, which ones we're using in our environment, and it, it doesn't have to be just one. All of these can be used in an enterprise. Of course, we have to be thinking about our least privileged principle. So this is ensures that users have the minimum level of access. And this is something that will have to be audited, guys. So this is something you want to ensure yearly that is happening. What do we mean by this is when we start out uh, with a new onboarding user, let's say we're a growing company, we start with least privilege. And it's kind of just uh, common sense, right? You just want someone to just have access to what they need and nothing more. But then as time goes on, and emergencies happen and users need access to data just for that day and then you're going to take it away and you forget we have something called privilege creep and that's essentially just uh almost negligence where we're giving users access to things just in the maybe the spur of the moment maybe they create a ticket and we say okay but in seven days we're taking this away and we just forget and maybe we don't have the right processes to do these automated auditing just something you have to think about then the purpose so authorization enforces access policies and permissions, preventing unauthorized actions, data breaches, and ensuring the principle of least privilege is followed. And now to kind of go over this diagram I have down here. So now that we're authenticated and you see my username and password's like seen now, the LDAP servers know you're already identified. 
Now we have the authorization request, which is, well, what do I have access to? And over in that, an ADUC environment, those LDAP servers are going to reference a couple of different things. Essentially, I'm just putting here some pseudo logic. So the access policy, well, what OU are you in? Okay, so because you're in the accounting OU user, you're going to get automatic accounting privileges. So maybe that group policy we apply to your user is account lease policy. The member groups you're a part of maybe just give you access to the file share just for the accounting department. And then maybe we have extra attributes here where this MS Exchange attribute maybe is giving you access to a Jabber account or maybe a third party something, right? That is authorization. So lastly, we're going to go over accounting. So definition. Accounting, also known as auditing, involves tracking and recording activities and actions of users and systems for later review and analysis. So what are we talking about here? So essentially, this is how we keep accountability of users' actions. So after they've been authenticated and authorized, that's it, right? If we didn't have accounting, we wouldn't know what the users were doing with their uh, permissions, with their access. So accounting is the uh, allows us to do reviews and audits on our systems, our objects, and our users. So part of that audit trail component is logging. Logging events, access attempts, and system changes should be recorded in either local logs and then should be aggregated into a central log. Very common nowadays is to have an SIEM or a SIEM solution like Splunk that does all that log aggregation for you. We also have like... Uh, Windows event log and stuff like that that can still be local. Monitoring. So how are we setting up the tracking? In our SOC, do we have our monitors and our dashboards sent up from Splunk to monitor suspicious or unusual behavior? How do we do monitoring? How do we alert, right? So just monitoring isn't good enough. If we see a positive flag come up for a user trying to do something malicious, like let's say log in at 9 a.m. in Wuhan, China, when our user sits in our office in San Francisco and they're not on vacation, that's something we may want to monitor and also actually uh, think about for our authentication. But anyways, getting ahead of myself, making sure we have alerts for suspicious or unusual behavior. And then, of course, forensics. If there is a breach, if we do have a cybersecurity incident, ensuring we have good accounting and auditing set up is going to help us in the investigation and analysis of those security incidences, okay? So we can use those audit logs to determine what happened, what time and how, and a lot of things go into setting up good accounting, making sure your time is synced, making sure that we're actually recording the right things, okay? And making sure it's not volatile information. So if we have logs that will disappear after the computer boots or system boots, we should be automatically sending those logs to a centralized place, which again, we can do that with like an SIM or SIM solution like Splunk. So the purpose, accounting enhances security by creating a trail of evidence, facilitating compliance, enabling real-time monitoring for anomalies, and assisting in post-incident analysis and investigation. Very common one here. I come from kind of a I do come from a network background. So an example I have here is a Cisco Identity Services engine using a AAA protocol called TACX that are pretty much is used to authenticate users trying to access a network resource. So we send a TACX request here, it gets authenticated. And then we send another TACX authorization, it gets authenticated here to our identity services engine. And then once we're completely authenticated and authorized, any command that we do on the CLI on this router is getting logged, right? That's the accounting uh, portion of our TACX AAA protocol. So here we can see command history log, every single command that a user has run, and then we have the timestamps here. So that's just a simple way you can do accounting on a networking infrastructure. All right, so now that we're done with the lecture portion of AAA, yep, the next thing I have to go over is zero trust. Now let's bring in some quiz questions. So I'm gonna go to our website, our academy here, and I'm gonna go over some quiz questions with you guys. So anytime, if, if you purchase our self-paced course on our website or our live virtual training, you get access to thousands of questions with uh, thousands of questions to help you uh, or assist you in getting certified. And this is the UI for it, okay? So question one, or before we get into it, guys, feel free to pause the video as I go through these questions. Before I answer it, I'm gonna try to give a little pause, okay? 
So what is the primary purpose of authentication in the AAA framework? So I'm going to go with to verify the identity of a user requesting access to network resources. All right, awesome. Then we get our explanation down here. So it says authentication is the process of verifying a user's identity, usually through credentials like username and password, biometrics, or security tokens. And it's the first step in the AAA framework. Moving on, in the AAA framework, what is the role of authorization? So I'm also gonna go with B. It defines what resources and services a user can access after being authenticated. Kind of a softball right there, right? So authorization occurs after authentication and determines what resources and services the authenticated user is permitted to access. It involves setting permissions and privileges for users and ensuring that they can only access the data, perform actions that are appropriate for their role or status. So going over those access control methods. And guys, just a little side note, anytime you answer a question, it's always gonna give you the explanation whether or not you got it wrong or right. So question three, what is the purpose of accounting in the AAA framework? So I'm just gonna take a wild guess here just to show you we get that explanation. So that is incorrect. The correct answer is C, to, uh, the purpose of accounting is to record the actions and resource usage of authenticated and authorized users. And then, of course, we get our explanation down here. This includes monitoring their network resource usage, what can be in, which can be important for security, auditing, and also billing purposes. I like that I added that in that explanation here. Billing purposes, especially if we're in the cloud, right? And someone runs up uh, an EC2 instance. Woo, we definitely want to make sure we have good auditing on that. All right, guys, I want to thank you for viewing this video. And if you're ever interested in getting free training, if you're an active duty reserve or National Guard soldier, please click that link in the description below to see how you can use the Army Credentialing Assistance to pay for any of our courses. You get 4000 a year and it's benefits that you earn and you should use. If your unit or corporation are interested in in-person training, we would love to come and train your teams and get them all certified in 8140 compliance or whatever technical certifications they need. And if you like this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And thank you for viewing, and stay tuned for the next video.